Hello and welcome to episode 2 of Treasure Hunting for Nostalgia. This is Brandon and Brad and we're here to give you part 2 of our what favorite games? Um what is it? Uh I'd say good feeling games. Good games, feeling games. Games that bring out the good feelings of our memories. Yeah, and we only limited ourselves to one per system, because if we were given an opportunity, we could have probably said five per system, ten per system, you know, except for maybe Sega Saturn or Sega CD. And uh, we'd probably be here until uh, 3 a.m. the next morning, uh, still going on one oh, system. That, that night when I stayed over your house till 4 or 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock, when, last week when Brian and Matt came over. Yes. Oh, I, I heard, I got an earful from my wife. I could tell. <laughs> Why? <laughs> okay, so I had a party at game night. Um, I moved a couple uh, months ago to a new uh, house. Had a first night over, had the guys over. Played games all night. No drinking or drugs involved. That's how we fly. No debauchery. No debauchery, no uh, swindling, no none of that uh, juvenile delinquency. Um or as Uncle Ron would say, uh, hookers. Hookers were not involved. Um, we're you know we're straight edge. We don't we don't like to drink. Um, only occasion I can remember the past year I probably had one or two drinks. Uh, no drugs. No smoking. Never done drugs. Never tried weed. Uh, none of that. So um, just hanging out, playing games. Uh, Street Fighter Four for PlayStation Three. Uh, playing this one French game. I can't even remember the name of it. Carcassonne. Uh, probably stayed until <clears throat> everyone probably left around four o'clock, uh, four fifteen. Uh, finally went. I, w I went to bed um, without hearing any of my phone phone calls. The like, phone buried in the cushions. Found my phone the next day. And that was from me falling asleep on the couch. Just shoving the phone into the crevices of the couch. Yeah, so, um, found my phone the next day, saw I had a voicemail, uh, and it was from Brandon's wife, Jamila. She left uh, a voicemail? She left a voicemail, uh, went, went a little something like this, um, <laughs> hey Brad, this is, uh, this is Jamila, Brandon hasn't answered his calls, he hasn't came home yet, can you call me back? And, uh, you know, not, uh, can, can you get, call me back when you got a chance, when you get a chance, can you give me a call back? No, like, you need to call me back. <laughs> and I, I was looking at my phone. I had to listen to the message again because I was taken back to it. I was kind of scared. I was like, what? Uh, not scared that Brandon was in an accident or anything, but scared because I know that wife tone. I've heard it before. <laughs> like, oh, shit, I need to listen to this again. And, yeah, so call me back. So I call... Um, we were planning on doing something. What was it, what was it that we did? Like, oh, going to. Um, you wanted to go to lunch. I wanted to go to lunch. Uh, text him. He didn't text me back. Uh, so uh, this is before I listened to my voicemail. So I listened to it. I called Jamila back, uh, and you know she was apparent. She was talking to Brandon. Um, uh, I what? thought he was getting an earful. Uh, what do you did she pick up and she just kept talking or 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 you, you she didn't answer so you thought she was talking to me no she answered oh okay uh, what drew me onto it is uh, you know she said uh, I, I called her back and said hey it's, it's Brad oh he got home I said oh okay that's good you want to talk to him like no <laughs> I I knew, I wanted to ask if he went to lunch he didn't a answer my previous text now for People who know me, I really don't have my phone on me all the time. I don't have it, uh, like Brad. It's never on my person for maybe longer than an hour if I need it. It'll sit in the garage for hours upon hours until I feel I need it. There's some people out there that send me text messages and get blatantly upset when I don't send a message directly back to them that second that I receive it or that they think I receive it. In all actuality, if I don't text you back, it's because... I don't have my phone and I don't see the text. Now you may get a text message from me maybe two days later responding to your text and you're saying, what is this about? And you forget all about the text you sent me. And that's just because I never really keep it on me. I And most of the time in order to contact Brad, I call Karen's phone and then she'll pick up and give him the phone. Yeah, and you know, that's just, you know, we're not phone addicts. We don't need our phone with us 100% uh, of our time. Uh, so at that moment, I was at a crossroads. I was sitting there talking to Jamila. Um, she never, she didn't even tell me that you called her back and that you guys had a conversation. 
Well, it, it, it was pretty much one-sided conversation, more of um, I could either ask her, right? she said, you want to talk to him, and when she said that, I knew that you were, you might be 99% you're in deep water, and I was thinking, should I ask to talk to him, to ask him to go to lunch, or should I just leave it, and he'll call me when he gets done speaking, and I, I chose the latter, I was no, nope, don't really need to talk to him at this moment, so... Yeah, I kind of knew that she uh, got upset about that. And especially when you asked me, hey, did Karen care that we were there until 4 o'clock? And I was like, well, she wouldn't have preferred it, but she didn't, you know, stay awake because she knew I was home. Uh, if I left, uh, you know, and was out until 4 o'clock in the morning and she called and I didn't answer, of course she would have got upset too. That's just how wives are. Uh, they just need to be kept in the loop of what's going on. And even talking to her, she... We have come to an agreement where when when we do game nights, she made brought up a good point. Yes, they go on. When we first started doing game nights, it would start around 7, end around 9 or 10. That was my preference. Uh, I always left early because I had felt a commitment to be home since I was married, be home at a decent hour, uh, even though I was letting her know, hey, I'm, I'm here, uh, texting her, hey, just checking in. Uh, so we came to agreement. Um, not to be out past a certain hour, probably around 11 or 12. Um, if that's going to, in the rare instance that it does happen, uh, call or text, let them, let the other party know, hey, I'm going to be out this much longer. Uh, for some reason, this past game night, not only did it go well past the curfew, but uh, I really didn't check in. Uh, and, you know, that got her worried. Um, of course, when anyone's left to their own devices and all all the you know the thoughts enter your head of what this person is doing, the different possibilities of what they're doing come into effect. Uh, and of course, there are always well, in my instance, and I'm sure Brad instance, they're never what they they imagine. You're not laying dead on the side of a road. You're not in a hotel room with. Uh, you got someone hook, you shouldn't be. You got a hooker's ankles above their head. Yeah, it's it's none of that. I we're just, we're just having fun, and I just you know lost track of the moment and I f fell asleep on the couch. And then when I woke up to get a ride home, and that was another thing. I didn't have my own. I didn't have the car. I left it with her. She dropped me off actually um, at Brad's house, and then I was going to get a ride home from one of our friends, and. I really didn't want to be like, hey, Brian, it's time to go. I need to be home by 11. Um, so, you know, I went halfway through the last game. I fell asleep, had to get up a few times to do my turns or whatever. So we left around 4, and I did have my phone on me, and I did not feel the phone vibrate because I had sweatpants on. So I get home. And, you know, she confronts me. I said, oh, you're still awake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's never a good sign. Well, I didn't, I didn't know she texted me. I didn't know she called me. I figured after she texted me at 10 saying, have a good night. I'll see you tomorrow or whatever she said. <laughs> and in that in my mind, I felt, okay, she's going to go to sleep. I don't have to check. Uh, I don't have to check in. Nope. That, I've only been married two years. You know, it doesn't enter my head. So I get home, and I said, "What are you still doing up?" Her response: "Why are out to? Why are you out to fucking five o'clock in the morning without your phone?" Yeah. <laughs> and I was like flabbergasted. That's the first time she ever directed a curse word to me, and I was and I was aghast. I said, "I fell asleep." And I'm sure you're more than a guest. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I was, I fell asleep, and I didn't feel my phone phone ring, and so I could feel her staring daggers at me as I laid in bed. I probably should have slept in the garage or on the couch or something, but I just laid in bed. Did you just like, eh, lay down and go to sleep? I did. Oh man, <laughs> and See, that's the thing is, uh. Uh, my, I used to do that a lot. I, I used to be in trouble. We'd be deep in the conversation, but we'd be laying down, you know, having our um, arguments or having our serious talks, 
and all of a sudden she'll just hear me snoring and I just fall dead asleep. And I'm I, having serious talk with you right now. <laughs> and I and and I'm there. My eyelids feel like a million pounds. They're fluttering, trying to keep them open. And all of a sudden she she hears it. <laughs> I said, "You are still going. I'm not asleep." <laughs> And uh, this is, uh, I have uh, sleep apnea, so I uh, would always have daytime sleepiness. I would have headaches uh, before I got my CPAP machine, so I would just fall asleep on a whim. And I cannot use that excuse anymore, even though at the time I didn't know what it was. But I, I cannot use that excuse. Uh, still happens on occasion. Uh, don't know if it's, uh, you know, just force of habit, how I, I just hear that argumentative voice in my wife's her tone of voice and it just puts me right to sleep so <laughs> so soothing so soothing <laughs> such a soothing uh, you know demeanor she has when, when she's upset um, you know it just brings you back to happier times so I wake up the next morning obviously I'm getting the silent treatment she says she doesn't want to talk to me because she doesn't want to say the wrong thing and I'm still like you know being me out we were just playing games so Later on that day, the after I find my phone and see Brad's text talking about wanting to go to lunch. I'm like, oh, so he tried to call me. So I go in the room, ask her if she wants to talk now. So we have this huge conversation about having, uh, doing the right thing and not only texting but being home at a reasonable hour. I wouldn't want her out till 4 o'clock in the morning without knowing where she is or checking in. Uh, so I was in the wrong. I admitted that. I did apologize. Uh, she said after she said she wanted to hit me in the head when I fell asleep last that night before, which I don't blame her. So what is it about women when you fall asleep on them during a serious moment? They well, just want to abuse you. Well, it's honestly I I didn't think I, maybe it was in the state of mind I was in. Maybe I was too tired, but she wasn't talking, and I told her where I was. And I thought everything was fine until I wake up the next morning and found out that everything wasn't fine. Yeah. And and, and that's the thing is they always want to just hit you upside the head. Uh, now, I have accidentally hit my wife in the head a couple of times when I've been sleeping. I'll, I'll fall asleep on my um, hand in bed on my side. And all of a sudden it'll drop and just, boom, hit her in her head and her head will all jerk. And <laughs> she's having a convulsion <laughs> and I was like did that wake her up <laughs> no okay I'm good and the next morning she's like you know I have a, I have a headache I was like uh oh um, yeah I kind of hit you in the head last night uh, it was on accident and, and you know she understands uh, you know I toss into her and I accidentally you know bruise her leg up sometimes but it's just because I'm just a beast. Yeah. See, and that's the thing is I'm pretty naive. I've only had two serious girlfriends in my life. Um, and me marrying my second one. And, you know, those thoughts that enter her head. Um, she's had a few bad relationships. And she pulls some of those feelings out. Like, for example, there's a time when I went over to Brad's, or we all went over to Brad's house for some function, or the family function, and I have my gym bag that I take everywhere. I carry everything in it. She calls it my security bag. I, I you know, carry my laptop, my gym clothes, different things, my DS, whatever I, I, I'm doing, sometimes my writing notebook. But one time over this, in this party, uh, we have a cousin She's about 17 now. At the time, she's about 15, 16. Uh, I call her Alexis. She hates that, I guess, and so that's why I keep calling her Alexis. I think she likes to be called Lexi. We should, we should just call her uh, the, that whose name we should not speak or uh, whatever it is. Uh, Voldemort. Yeah. So, Alexis, I guess, had her feet near my bag, and her shoes, she took off her shoes, which landed in my bag. So... You know, we leave the party, go home, uh, have a good night, you know, uh, I don't know what we did, probably watch a movie or had family time or something. So, I wake up, go to work, I leave my gym bag for some reason, and I get a text message on my phone, 
not just a text message but a picture text and the picture text says whose are these with a picture of Alexis's shoes and I said I don't know I don't know whose shoes those are are they yours <laughs> and then you know my naivety speaks in my voice I mean I don't I don't know whose shoes those were and that just brings up bad feelings for her in her previous relationship she did deal with someone who lied a lot and lied to her and so when of course whenever she confronted this bad person about you know where they were uh, whose articles of clothes may these be and of course I don't know coming from a liar means I know I just don't want to tell you I don't know coming from me means I have no idea whose shoes those are why don't we get to the bottom of this and figure this mystery out together <laughs> like the Scooby game yeah I mean let's find the case of the missing shoes so I'm on it I'm like obviously she's mad because I wouldn't get a text in whose are these with 8,000 question marks after those words so I send I asked Brad I said is Karen missing shoes uh, I call my mom I said mom are you missing shoes come to find out it's Lexi's shoes that just so happened got in our bag and, and it I think I remember this is because I think Lexi took home Karen's shoes so in everybody's mind everybody's shoes were accounted for except for the mystery shoes exactly so um, so just things like that the the I don't knows coming from me means you know I don't know but coming to her brings up those bad memories which she projects to me uh, and it's hard to you know follow a uh, homeboy who did wrong and you know did all the dirty work with the proclamation of I don't know and her he, a, he laid the soiled foundation yeah it was the most soiled foundation in the world and, and the thing um, I don't know we've actually been working on this me and my wife is she'll ask me a question and I'll just be like I don't know like oh uh, you know uh, you know how uh, you know what bills do we need to pay this pay period what pills do we need to pay this pay period I'm just like I don't know and and that uh, I've been working on because that's just a scapegoat to be like you know I don't want to think about it right now I, I, I'm you know stressed whatever I don't know and well I wasn't using it as a scapegoat uh, in I, my instance <laughs> you what? just truly didn't Gosh. know but that's what I'm saying is um, that just brings up that we're working on that I use I don't know as a way to try to avoid the problem uh, and and you know it, it's different meaning for everybody yeah all right so where were we going with that story uh, I think we were going into our list here oh okay uh, our last episode we went through uh, Nintendo Super Nintendo Genesis Sega City Sega Saturn uh, we told you our feel-good games we had some similarities maybe we should try to when we say our game maybe just give it more description I know last game we tried to give some description but I know maybe some people didn't play Breath of Fire 2 they don't know the the Oompa Roopas or whatever we tried to describe but let's try to give some more detail in the list and we are moving to okay we are moving to 64 Nintendo 64 a lot of good games on this system. Uh, I had a few that I was kicking around in my head, um, but none that really seemed to stand out the most. As uh, does your Nintendo 64 game have 64 in the title? It does not. Oh, mine does. So uh, there were a lot of games. Uh, Nintendo did seem to have a cliche of making everything like Super Nintendo. Let's call it Super Ghouls and Ghosts. Let's call it Super... Well, it was already Super Mario Brothers, but... Uh, Donkey Kong 64. This time seemed to... Pilot Wings 64. Yeah. They didn't have Super Pilot Wings, but yeah, Pilot Wings 64, just... Kirby 64. Just using the heck out of that name. So the... They were so proud of that 64. And the Super, like Super Nintendo. You never saw Sega thing. Sega Sonic the Hedgehog, or Genesis... Hedgehog. They, Sonic the Genesis. Well, they did have say, uh, Sonic CD. They did. But yeah. very rare instances where Nintendo's like, okay, so we're going to re release uh, a Nintendo DS. 
we're going to name all of our titles with D or S in the title, like Castlevania Dawn of Sorrow. And, <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's just, it gets annoying after a bit. <clears throat> okay, so my 64 game happens to be uh, the only Mario game on my list, and that's Super Mario 64. Mario 64 um, is actually a game we got uh, for Christmas, uh, of course, when it released. Um, we knew we were getting it. We kind of, um, our grandma told us, oh, I wasn't able to get you the Nintendo 64. I got a voucher for it, so maybe you'll get it in a couple months. Uh, I That was actually one of the first Christmases, the only Christmases where I actually looked at the present. Uh, my mom took us to, um, it took me to Sears, our her her uh, shopping uh, place of choice uh, that was her store because she had that credit card uh, and uh, in the bag uh, was Mortal Kombat trilogy for the Nintendo 64. So I kind of spoiled my Christmas that year, but um, we knew we were getting it. We were so excited to get it. It was uh, years ahead of its time. With uh, you know, you look at Super Mario World for Super Nintendo to that, and it's just it really was a great game. Yeah, it's mind blowing. I just remember playing it at Blockbuster Video, just looking at that controller, saying, "How do you maneuver with this thing?" And to this day, I think you still hold the controller wrong. <laughs> uh, for th those you don't know, it's it's kind of a um, uh, I don't even know how to describe it except a, a three a pronged force, a, a four symbol upside down. Uh, got three little. Uh, it's like a W, an upside down W is how you hold it, or an M. It could be considered an M. Uh, I I hold it one on each side uh, on the outside. I can't hold uh, the middle wrong and the the right side at the same time. I don't know why, but uh, that's just how I play it. Yeah, for I mean, when we played it at Blockbuster, we didn't we knew knew better. So of course we held it like a Super Nintendo controller. You know, one hand on the outer edge of each side, using our thumb overextending our thumb to the analog <laughs> stick, having no control over it whatsoever <clears throat> until we finally get the system in our hand, the controller, and I'm like, look, you grip the middle and use your thumb so it can move in every direction, not just one direction. And look, see the trigger back here? You use this finger for the Z trigger because there's a trigger on the back right behind the middle part of the controller. And even... Years past that, when even when you know GameCube was out and all these other systems, I'd still see Brad with the controller with the amateurish grip of overextending his thumb past the analog stick. I'm like, no. I'm thinking to myself, why are you holding like that when you know it's the wrong way? That's just that's just how nature raised me, I guess, because that's what feels to home. Uh, my hands need to be on the outer edge if it's on the as as you uh. <clears throat> Uh, posh people grip it the normal way uh, with the middle rung and the right rung. Hoity-toity. Hoity-toity. Uh, I just can't do that. It doesn't feel like I have full control unless my thumb is uh, dislocated playing that joystick. Yeah, so Mario 64, the graphics were amazing for its time. 64-bit uh, graphics. Uh, of course, you have to save Princess Peach from Evil Clutches of Bowser. Uh, of course, Mario doesn't know that. He just gets a letter from Peach saying, come visit me in the castle. Come get some pussy. Yeah. <laughs> the the E-rated version was, I have a cake for you. So he <laughs> and we all knew what that <laughs> cake was. It was actually a cherry pie. <laughs> a cream pie. So you go, you know, you go to the castle of Mushroom Kingdom and something's amiss. Uh, so you, There's no one there. Yeah, you find out that Bowser's taking over the castle. The only way to get through the castle was to find uh, stars in each level. There are seven stars in each level. There were giant paintings all over the castle and you make your way through the, you jump in a painting and let's say the painting's um, a pic, uh, you know, a picture of two snowmen. Uh, you jump in the painting and you're transported to this snow world where you have to, it's a huge level on its own. Uh, there's hidden stars throughout each uh, painting, I believe seven like you said, and you collect these. Uh, once you get a star, you you get uh out, you get blasted out of the painting and you have to go back in and find another one uh so on and so forth uh the more stars you get the more wings open up in the castle uh when you know the further in the castle you go the closer you get at beating the game and i remember uh we had a friend ken 
uh, Ken Cheney, he was like the guru of games. He taught us about Ogre Battle. He told us when we, uh, we, we thought we were just a shit with, you know, the Phantom spell in Ogre Battle, for example. Uh, in, in this game, you basically answer a series of questions at the beginning of the game, and that determines your alignment, if you're good or evil. And based on how evil you are, you get a certain spell. Based on how good you are, you get a certain spell. So there's you know, all these factors. You can get different spells in the beginning of these five spells. We always wanted to get the phantom spell. And that just whacked everyone out. And Ken t turned to us and he said, No, your game's evil. You, you, Sir, you're doing it all wrong. Yeah, you're, you enlisted the help of Deneb the Witch? No, you're... How he, dare you? Yeah, and so he, you know, guided us into, you know, getting the legendary sword Brunhild, which you could only get if you were a good character. If you had maximum charisma. Yeah, you need the charisma. If you have maximum charisma, then you could get Brunhild and visit the four the four islands of the floating cities. So, you know... Of we course, did. Ken didn't talk like that. No, Ken, <laughs> Ken was, a like, a, you know, kind of like a laid-back surfer guy. Yeah, he, he didn't surf, but uh, he, he was. He had the hair... Yeah. Uh, we'd always see him running, uh, jogging around the high school, uh, just, you know, always just, I guess, being an active nerd, because I guess he did lose a lot of weight, and even at his day, he's rather skinny. But, yeah, he taught, taught us about Ogre Battle, and one day, we were talking about Mario 64, and he said, yeah, I got all 120 stars. I was like, what? I was like, how? He's like, oh, just finding him. And that just blew my mind, because, like, there's no way you could find all 120 stars without any help. So I think that was the beginning of me becoming the completest for every game I play, trying to beat it on the hardest difficulty ever. I think that's a game that made me want to become a completist, and just I've, I've been doing that since. What's your uh, Nintendo 64 game? I have down here, I've contemplated uh, you know, a bunch, but I got down GoldenEye. Yeah. GoldenEye was uh, really a, a, what got me into, um, I guess, shooters. I don't play shooters by far. I, I actually despise them. I only play a couple. Uh, but it was actually a good shooting game. Uh, you know, split screen. You could go up and uh, battle each other. Uh, GoldenEye was a first-person shooter where you actually got to play out the movie GoldenEye on your Nintendo 64. James Bond. James Bond. Um, <clears throat> different degrees of difficulty um, you know for me actually being able to play the game on um, completing it uh, was far a, a good challenge in it of itself and then adding the multiplayer into it where you could just go to the facilities uh, to the bathroom level plant mines in the urinals I thought was amazing uh, proximity mines and someone walks by you know, oh you think you're gonna walk by to go pee nope you're gonna get blowed up getting pissed off when you look on your opponent's screen and see they're heading towards the bulletproof armor or they, you know, have the the powerful golden gun in their hand, or uh, you know, that one RCP ninety or whatever mm -hmm. it's called. Um, uh, actually, was a uh, it was a great game. player game. Uh, spent hours on it uh, just by itself. <clears throat> yeah, it was fun. Another thing about shooters, I think the only shooters I'll ever play are ones where I'm not shooting humans. I just don't find the appeal in it, like with those modern warfare games and stuff. Give me something evil to, to destroy it I'm happy resistance is a good example um, Bioshock yes they were human but they were jacked up you know they're, they're disfigured they had on crazy crazy masks so I felt okay with killing those uh, but just the modern warfare human on human I just don't it doesn't just it doesn't do it for me <clears throat> so next we have uh, Dreamcast yep. Dreamcast uh, this game I actually had a lot of fun with. Huge party game. I uh, played it with uh, Brad and mainly with uh, my friend Nick. Virtua Tennis. Had so much fun with it. Playing, developing the strategy front and back. I would play the front of the net. He would play the back of the net. And we just dominate anyone that tried to play. Uh, I'd be courier from USA. He would be Federer from Spain or Italy or something. And we just blast through anyone that tried to opposition to us, we would just destroy them out of the water. What did you pick? Uh, I picked Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Uh -huh. uh, I picked that because I really didn't own a player. It brings me back to um, after graduating uh, high school, I could uh, get my life uh, on the right track with uh, a job, 
taking care of Jordan. You had to work because you had a baby. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't just be deadbeat dad. No. <laughs> Repeat history with uh, our dad. Yeah. Um, you know, getting married and things like that. So it was actually nice when, um, you know, we'd get together. I'd go over there for the, the afternoon and uh, my mom would order Red Runner pizza. We'd have that big old sausage pizza that would give you stomach aches to no end. But um, we got to go over and play that and uh, it just reminded me of uh, the good old days. Yeah, not much to say about Dreamcast. They had some pretty good games, you know, Power Stone, Power Stone 2. That was, really wasn't a, fun, a fond uh, of Sonic the Hedgehog, you know, Sonic Adventure. That really didn't do it for me, so... Next is GameCube. Yep. This um, game I chose for GameCube has bittersweet memories for me. It was after my breakup from my first girlfriend. I just went out and just had to buy this, buy some game to play to take me back to uh, where I could just feel like a kid again with no worries. You know, those emotions, those little girly emotions that, that just, you know, run through you and rip you to shreds. Uh, I went over to uh, Dimple Records after the, the day after, and I was looking for some game to take me back. And all of a sudden, I see Mega Man One through Six uh, for GameCube. I don't I don't believe it was remastered. Remastered? No. Nope. Yeah. So straight ports from the NES. Got that. Called up Brad. Said, "Hey, you wanna play Mega Man Collection?" He said, "Yep." So I brought it over, and we started playing Mega Man. Yep. Um, I have down. Uh, Probably one of the last uh, great games of the GameCube. I got into the GameCube uh, late because I also didn't get that. I was, I was, this was when I was moved out. I yeah. didn't get the uh, spoiling of the new systems. Yeah, so this was uh, the time when I was out of the house and my uh, systems went on hold. Um, I didn't get a lot because I was just you know newly married. Didn't have a lot of money to afford. Um, until I got uh, discovered that I could get a credit card. And I went to Dimple Records and bought a used uh, GameCube and a used Nintendo 64 just to make up lost time. Uh, but uh, the, the game that I'm going to uh, talk about is Resident Evil 4, uh, which is uh, one of the greatest games uh, on GameCube that was released. Yeah, I knew you were going to pick that one. Resident Evil 4 uh, was a great game. It actually uh, took the uh, genre into a new direction where on the previous Resident Evil games you played through, uh, you know, as a fixed angle camera. Uh, every room that you went in, the cameras are fixed at uh, different uh, angles uh, depending on where you were standing in the room. Resident Evil 4 took the action uh, behind you. You actually, when you walked around, that camera was behind you. Uh, you got to see a little bit of the um, of Leon's back and back of his head and his back uh, over the shoulder kind of deal. Uh, I like Resident Evil 4 because you could see Leon's back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, it, it really was, uh, the storyline was great. Uh, there was uh, a time where, um, you know, you start out in the village all alone in the love, in the first part of the game. Uh, all of a sudden, all these enemies start coming at you, these uh, evil, uh, plaga-driven uh, humans. Uh, some guy comes out and jumps at you with a chainsaw and just cuts your head off. And it's just a great game. Uh, not just because of that, because of the whole storyline. Uh, I remember... Uh, I was playing it again with Logan just a couple years ago, uh, actually last year, right before Part 6 came out, and um, he was playing through the, the game, and uh, all of a sudden the Dr. Salvador uh, comes out, the guy with the chainsaw, and he's got a burlap sack over his face like Leatherface, uh, or Jason from Friday the 13th Part 2, and he just comes out, and, and he just cut Logan's head off, and Logan was <laughs> so scared. <clears throat> Uh, he was scared. He, he, you know, he wanted me to play it so I could beat the guy, which I did. So let's take it back a few years with the PlayStation. Uh, you know, many names: PS1, PSX, PlayStation. I just call it PlayStation One. Uh, the game that I have on my list: uh, Resident Evil Two. Uh, not just because of the game, but the great lengths we went to get the game. Oh man, there are so many notes left. So what we did is uh, we were begging for a game, and for some reason my mom said no. Uh, what? I'm like, how can you say no? It's just a game. It's not a system. You it's know. only fifty dollars. It's only fifty dollars. We're not asking for a new system here, geez. And she told us no. 
So I was taken aback by it. I was like, what are we going to do? I know, we'll just bug the shit out of her until she gets it for us. <laughs> so me and Brandon got, uh, we used to eat, uh, eat on paper plates sometimes. And not the cool Dixie paper plates, the sturdy ones. These were like the ones that were not even a millimeter thick. These were the cheapo paper plates that you could see through. <laughs> you put some spaghetti on it, it falls right through the plate. <laughs> right through the plate. <laughs> like you have to oh. double up, triple up on those ones. Yeah, you get five plates just to get a, a scoop of spaghetti. But um, we would get these paper plates and we would write, please buy us Resident Evil 2 on them. We would post them in the cupboard, on the mirror, in the toilet seat. Uh, wherever you could think we would put it <laughs> under her pillow, uh, <laughs> next to her maxi pad, <laughs> next to her maxi pad, uh, you know, just <laughs> anywhere you could think of. <laughs> it became a game. We were like, how long is it going to take her to find this one? And she always, we always knew when she found it. Stop I'm wasting the plates! <laughs> Again? Okay. Yeah, and, you know, we would just hide them everywhere and, and uh, please buy us or anything to we never. She never bought it for us. Uh, even after that, a we, savior came along. A savior in the name of Uncle Ron, who is the greatest uncle to ever live uh, in anybody's existence. Uh, uncle Ron is, um, uh, you know, very special to us. He he's uh, my mom's brother. Uh, he's su he's su he's got such a big heart. He's uh, good-hearted, uh, heart of gold, you know. So um, he. Uh, was moving one day uh, from one apartment to another in our complex and we helped him move and so we kind of hinted hey Uncle Ron uh, since we're helping uh, you move you know you know it would be great if you bought us this game uh, he actually bought us the game uh, you know when we first played the game we rented it from Blockbuster and, uh, and I have good <coughs> memories about that because not only did we rent it from Blockbuster but it had rain that day. It was El Nino season. It was El Nino season. Where this huge storm from the west came in and just flooded the shit out of our school. We, uh, we went to school in Rio Linda High School. Uh, this guy, Tim Clark, was running around with his, I don't know, he was doing uh, gang member signs or something. This chunky white dude, he could have been our cousin, had his ha hands up in there, El Nino! El Nino! And we were just like, dude, shut up. Go home. So uh, they let us out of school on the, and that was on a Friday, I believe. Uh, and we got to stop by Blockbuster, rent the game, and just fell in love with it. I don't know, Resident Evil. I just didn't have a a knack for. Even uh, we even recorded ourselves playing the game through a VCR. Uh, we we hooked it up to the VCR and were able to record with in one sitting beating back-to-back -back both storylines without saving it and I don't know how much I contributed to that uh, little if none but uh, we played through both games uh, we have it the tape somewhere our mom probably has it it was probably the, the first video guide maybe not the first but you know it's very prolific no one in our school had ever heard of it and I believe we borrowed lent the tape tape out people watched it and were, oh that's pretty cool so we came up with a plan to manipulate our Spanish teacher in 10th grade, uh, Senora Leon, at the end of the school year uh, to let us not only play the game in her classroom with her TV, but to stay there from first period all the way to sixth period to just play games. So other classes were going on while we, Brad and I, were just huddled in the corner with a few other people. Was there anyone else there? Ronnie Branham. Ronnie Branham. So we sat in the corner playing this game, Resident Evil 2, throughout all six periods. And we just let our teachers know, say, hey, it's the end of the year. We're just going to be in this class all. I was like, okay, no problem. I remember this guy. So anyways, yeah, I just remember playing through that game. And then Brad's like, hey, why don't you take over? I'm like, okay. So I jump on. We're, I'm in the sewer, you know, trying to get past some spiders. And, of course, we're trying to do it without saving it, uh, without saving the game, you know, hardcore. So I'm in this sewer, and the, the spider just comes out of nowhere and bites me, and it kills me. So <laughs> okay, now, may I point out, I don't think anyone in the history of Resident Evil has ever died by one of those giant spiders. <laughs> it's, like, impossible to get bit by. I don't even know how you did it. It was a small corridor, and they were... They were not fast, but when they bunched up, I just couldn't get around it. So I died, and that ended that run. And just like the 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 just the air just left Brad's body. He's like, what? 
She's like, you died? I'm like, what? Just start over. It, it was my goal to get through the whole game in one sitting uh, in, in the classroom on the last day of school. I don't know why it was such a goal for me, but uh, I don't know if I would have thought people would have thought it was cool. You know, but, you know, let's say it did happen. Let's say you didn't die of the spider. Let's say I made it past the tyrant, and I turn around and be like, I just beat the game on uh, without saving it and without dying. And all the teenagers would have looked at me and then just went back to what they were doing. All the so. girls would have been wet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably what it was in my head. Like, you could get some girls wet by doing this. But, no, the, the girls would not have gotten wet the, the guys would not have lifted me on their shoulders and been like you go man you go Bart <laughs> no there would have been none of that oh uh, so my PlayStation game I chose one that is a little obscure uh, thinking back it's just one that I've been wanting to play for the longest time it, it's you can only get it on the disc you can't get it downloaded of course you could probably emulate it but like Brad said we don't do that were hardcore. Uh, this game, I just liked it because of the environment. It was dark. It was moody. Uh, you, 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 it was just walked around in this black fog. Um, and that game is Legend of Lagaya. Uh, I don't know how you say it. Lagaya, Lagaya, however you say it. It's just such a, a, a atmospheric game. Of course, I could have went with Zeno Gears or Final Fantasy VII, or uh, I almost went with Symphony of the Night. But Legend of Lagaya, uh, I just remember playing that with Matt all the time, um, trying to figure out all the different moves. Basically, you're in this world where a dark fog just encompasses the earth, and you have to uh, find shining seeds or something. You have to get these trees to grow and shine the light on and uh, get the fog disappeared. It's a role-playing game. Uh, the battle system was unique. That's what I really liked about it. Uh, the battle system, you had to input different uh, to pull off combos and figure out special arts, they called them. And uh, once you unlocked an art by doing a random combo, it stayed with you. But it was just a fun game. I knew Brad was going to pick uh, Resident Evil 2, so I didn't want to pick that. Oh, so even though you didn't play the game, you were going to pick that? I, I was going to because it was... It had the, just that, the day of it flooding. Um, I, I still, we got a sample of Old Spice Pure Sport in the mail as a sample. And that's still the deodorant that I use because of that game. Hmm. Yeah, because using that deodorant is the day we played that game. And it just, every time I smell Old Spice Pure Sport, uh, just it just reminds me of that game. So, PS2? Yep. PlayStation 2. Uh, I had a tough time with this one. Uh, I didn't really know... I couldn't really link anything, any good feeling memories to PS2 because most of the games I played, I was I didn't play. I just played alone. I was out of the house, uh, living by myself. Really, um, I was. I ended up saying God of War 2, only because that was a game that I brought and brought over and had Brad watch me play it. I had him for. I forced him to watch me play it on the hardest difficulty, and uh, of course, I didn't get through it in one sitting, so I had to keep coming back. Well, I wouldn't say you you'd have to force me because I really it was it was cool watching the story and everything. So I had to save the game, uh, leave, you know, come back next weekend or whenever the next day I, had, I was available to come back, uh, just go through the game. Probably took about five five nights and just the frustration of almost wanting to throw the controller because it was either I think it was Sam who ran across, knocked the controller from my hand. It goes flying to the TV or by the PlayStation, and and I ended up dying when I had almost killed Zeus at the end. Just frustrating. Ended up ended up beating it, but still it was. The, my kids are infamous for that. <clears throat> I remember playing Final Fantasy IX for the PlayStation. Uh, you know, hardly ever saved it because there was really no reason to hardly ever save it except when you were done playing it. Uh, Jordan would come running by, knock the PlayStation over kill my game after I found like this the super secret Kokobo, Chocobo treasure you could find. You still say Chocobo? Kokobo, Chocobo. Nick, I always have debates with Nick, our good friend Nick. I always say Kokobo, he said, but it has a C and an H. You should say Chocobo or Chocobo. I say no, I'll say it my way and I won't change it. Yeah, and, and it's, 
you know, ever since then I've been so paranoid. I save my game probably every a, a game that doesn't have auto save. I'll save it every five minutes, even on the DS. Uh, just because of that point, I'm just so paranoid over. But um. Yeah, you wouldn't have to think about, you wouldn't think that you have to save it on the DS, but when I'm at work and I'm going to the bathroom, I bring my DS in, and, you know, after, I usually play Pokemon, but right now I've actually started playing Chrono Trigger finally for the DS. I got it well, five years ago when it came out for DS and haven't played it, so I started playing that, but when I used to play Pokemon or Dragon Quest Nine, you know, I'd get done with the bathroom, I'd set the DS on the metal tray where the toilet paper is, and it would freeze the game. I'm like, how how it just sitting my DS down just make it freeze so I have to restart. So every time I go, I'm always saving it on the DS when you really shouldn't have to. Yeah. Uh, I guess my PlayStation 2 game uh, was kind of an easy one to choose. Uh, like Brandon said, this is a time when we were alone. We didn't get to play as much together. Uh, I chose Silent Hill 2 uh, just because my the greatest franchise I believe is are out there are Resident Evil and Silent Hill, just because I like those genre of games. Uh, Silent Hill 2 is very creepy. It was a scary game. Uh, really tripped your mind out. Uh, introduced Pyramid Head, uh, the you know one of the main horror characters of the game. You know, just ba basically making it happen. And once you find out what happens, it's a real, real mind trip. Uh, it's the first game that I actually uh, you know played games like that with my mind. So that's why I chose that one. Okay. Uh, we. Yeah, we can go we. Okay, we. I'm gonna say uh, just out of the gate, uh, Super Smash Brothers Brawl. As soon as I picked it up, took it right over to Brad, and we started playing. And uh, it was, you know, just as good as Melee. People go back and forth that it was Melee's better. I th I th in my opinion, I think Melee is better because they nerfed down. They they've in this version they've made Samus weaker than she was in the Melee version. That's my only complaint. Yeah, so we, not too many, I hate to say it, but Nintendo hasn't made too many good games uh, since Super Nintendo. You know, Super Nintendo was just, I think, the golden age of of their whole legacy, and since then it's been, you know, few and far between with great games from Nintendo. Yeah, they just keep, keep to their staples, the Metroids, the Zeldas, uh, you know, they go on from there, uh, Mario. Uh, then they put them all in one big game, and there you go, so... Uh, my game that I chose, uh, I really, you know, think about different types of games, and I'm just going to, it's probably the, um, off of this list, the only Zelda game I have on here, which is Skyward Sword, uh, just because uh, the the motion controls on it were so great. Uh, I really enjoyed the storyline, even though I thought that it would have been better if they turned Groose into Ganon, which is where it looks like it should have been going, but then no, they end up being friends at the end. But, um, yeah... I can't, I, yes, my the, my favorite Zelda game of all time is going to be Link to the Past, uh, but once they started making Link right-handed because that's the majority of people, that just turned me off, and you have people on the boards, oh, uh, he's ambidextrous, yeah. he, he could fight with both hands, well, no, he started out as left-handed, he's he's always going to be left-handed, and I always, it, it always, uh, you know, makes me a little hard to swallow when I with every sword swipe where he's right handed um, but I, I just you know picked that one because the, the controls are so much better I almost chose Twilight Princess for GameCube even though I never played the game <laughs> Be just because he's left handed in that but I never played it so I don't really have any feel good memories for that game so I didn't put it on my list yeah I remember getting it um, when it came out I took Jordan my oldest son to the to the midnight Earth. release Earth he is Earth He's the one the he's unmovable. He's, he's centered. He's uh nurturing, uh you know, all around good kid. Yeah, so uh I took Jordan down to the midnight release. Uh he really wanted to go. He wanted to do, you know, he, he, of course, I know he looks up to me. He he wants to enjoy the things I do. So, um, you know, I appreciate him for that. So, um we went up there. His other brothers could have went but they fell asleep and Jordan's look at him like you, you guys are such losers you fell asleep I'm going with dad so we drive up to the Walmart and we we're trying to get the golden controller that comes with it of course they didn't have any because they're retards uh, we got lost on the way back because it was so dark you got lost coming home from Walmart yeah I went to the one uh, that I don't usually go to uh, the one up here on Antelope 
the 24-hour one. They didn't have it at the other one was closed, so I had to go to the one that I wasn't familiar with at the time. And I was trying to take a shortcut home so I could play it. Um, shortcut didn't work out. I ended up, you know, in a dead end. I hit lots of dead ends, but finally got home. Uh, I had the next day off. I didn't pop it in that night because Jordan fell asleep on the way home. Uh, so I, I played it the next morning when he was watching me and uh, Logan always begged me to come home uh, to play it you know can you play Zelda can you play that so um, Twilight Princess I believe yeah you got me you guys got me the Wii and Twilight Princess for Christmas one year uh -huh. and so I'm sitting there I'm playing through of course you already beat it I'm sitting there playing and so I'm coming I come over to your house and sitting there talking about Zelda, I was like, Zant is pretty cool, um, too bad Ganon's not in it, and Logan says, Ganon's in it, <laughs> I said, what, he's the last boss, so he spoiled the game for me, I knew that Ganon was coming into play, uh, because there was no sign of him in the game, not until like halfway to three quarters, yeah, you find out that someone's controlling Zant, and it ended up being Ganon, but that was a little dick move. Yeah, of course he he didn't know he was he didn't know what he was. Oh, he doing. had a smile on his face like he knew. He's like, I'm gonna spoil this shit for you right now. And there's nothing that Brandon or I hate more than either a game or movie getting spoiled oh, for us. Our mom used to do it all the time. She uh spoiled uh spoiler uh, alert. Uh, she spoiled um, what's it called? Pay it forward for Brandon. There is no mention no even inkling thinking that Haley Joel Osment was going to get shanked at the end of the movie and gutted and uh, right off the bat what did mom tell you he the little boy dies at the end yeah and it, it's and just, only because she heard it from a radio show she didn't see the movie she just heard it from the radio show and had, had to share the news <laughs> she just had to share the news that she didn't yet get from herself and you know she she thought she was all high and mighty uh, so she wanted to spoil it for everybody else. She felt like the tallest, tallest dwarf in the circus. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, th so this is spoilers. Um, that's one one thing to get on our, you know. So I, I got her back for that one. All of all the movies she spoiled for me. I don't even know if she spoiled any other ones, but that one just pay for I never seen the movie to this day because of that. I won't watch it because I know he dies at the end. So what's the point? So. Uh, one day, or one night, uh, Nick, our good friend Aaron, and myself went to the midnight showing of Gladiator. It wasn't the midnight showing, it was just a midnight showing. Uh, so we decided to go see it. It was pretty good. Uh, Russell Crowe was pretty cool, but... Uh, spoiler alert, at the end he dies. Well, it's been, what, 13 years since the movie's been released, but... So, I come home, go to sleep, I just can't wait, I just, I'm gonna get her... I have dreams about waking up and just telling my mom what's going to happen. So I wake up. Before she could even say hi, I open the door. She's on the toilet uh, with this um, magazine, People Magazine. And I say, Gladiator dies at the end. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't use Maximus. You didn't even use, you know, uh, Russell Crowe. You pulled a Homer Simpson and it just went, Gladiator. <laughs> I had to. I was just. I just. Ready to die. And that is so unlike you. You, you know, you <laughs> usually like Maximus Rivera who <laughs> dies at the end by the king, played by Joaquin Phoenix. Well, you just went <laughs> there. You were so excited. You probably had drool and snot coming out of your mouth. Yeah, you your mouth filling up with water, salivating. Gladiator dies at the end. <laughs> and I was take that, mom. <laughs> I was in my underwear. Uh, big hairy beast lumbering in, knocking open the bathroom. Still had morning wood. <laughs> she had no privacy. Like, what is that pointing at me? But no, she no privacy at all. Kick open the door. <laughs> she looked at me like I was an intruder. Well, I guess I was intruding in the bathroom. And just that that gratification, because I knew she wanted to see it. She was gonna go see it. I was like, glad to get her dies at the end. <laughs> And she just looks at me, what? Why did you tell me? I said, remember paying it forward three years ago? When well, now I'm paying it back. <laughs> yeah, I'm not paying it forward anymore. I'm paying it back. And now Gladiator dies. And now you know. And you can't watch the movie. 
Yeah, yeah, but you, she still watched the movie and enjoyed it. <laughs> she did watch the movie, but still, it just felt so good. You don't know how good it felt. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so so we're going to move on to our uh, final system, PlayStation 3. Uh, one of my favorite systems now. Um, Coming from Nintendo fanboys, the only reason we even moved to PlayStation is because Final Fantasy moved from Super Nintendo to PlayStation. They sold out and went to CD. We had we were devastated. We said we had to look at it. We have to get a PlayStation now. We even went to uh, an old video game store called Video Game Evolution, who sold used Nintendo games, used Super Nintendo games, and we actually went and discussed with him. Did you know Final Fantasy is going to PlayStation, and why did you not tell us? <laughs> kind of attitude, and we were just so taken back and so betrayed. We couldn't. We couldn't take it out on uh, Squaresoft. We couldn't take it out on Sony or Nintendo. We went into the video game evolution <laughs> hippie guy who probably just smoked two joints and was taking it out on him. And he's like, who are these little fat twins coming in here telling me about Final Fantasy? He must have thought he was having the biggest trip of all. So uh, we moved over to PlayStation with Final Fantasy and um, actually enjoyed many great games off it. Castlevania Symphony of the Night is a great game. Um but back to the PlayStation 3. Uh, the game I put down, uh, even though it's a shooter and I despise shooters, got to be Bioshock. Yeah, I almost put that one down as mine. Bioshock is such a great game. You never get such satisfaction playing the game on the hardest difficulty, killing all the big daddies without using a Vita Chamber, and actually getting a platinum on one playthrough. I've done it three times and it's highly enjoyable every time. Yeah. So, Bioshock was almost my number one choice. Oh, it was, but I figured Brad would choose it, so I went with uh, Survival Horror Games. The only one I really liked for the PlayStation, uh, Dead Space. It's just creepy. I even stopped playing it at night at, at one point when I first got it because I just couldn't handle it. It was scary. Just the noises, you would hear the noises out of the garage. I could have and I heard necromorphs outside uh, or even behind me in my big chair as I played but basically you're you take the role of this guy named Isaac and uh, well off into the future there's a, a, there's a form of a resource gathering called planet cracking where they're sending these huge ships off into space and find planets to just take chunks out of and mine their resources and resources and send them back to earth so, one of the ships gets in trouble. Hold then, on. Do you know where the game is so I could borrow it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can keep talking. Oh, okay. Uh, it's down there. It's in one of those stacks. So, uh, this this thing breaks, the ship breaks down, the USG Ishimura, uh, the, it's the plant, one of the planet crackers that these planets so all communication is down. You are Isaac. You are a chief engineer sent to repair the ship. You uh, go with a group of people, find the Ishimura, get on board, and all hell breaks loose. There's uh, alien beings. I don't want to really spoil it for Brad since he's about to start playing it, but let's just say there's alien beings that are you have to kill. And it's unique because... Unlike Resident Evil or Silent Hill or any of those survival horror games, it's you don't want to shoot them in the head. Instead, you want to rip their limbs off. Wow, I don't see it. Cut their limbs off. There's another stack, too. Oh, probably not. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't cut off your, their heads. You shoot the, their limbs off because that's, I guess, their source of power. I believe it explains it in one of the chronicles or one of the audio tapes you find. I just don't remember, but uh, yeah, you end up going through the game. Uh, really good storyline, um, uh, especially on the hardest difficulty. Well, actually, no, it's not not as hard as part two. Part two, uh, the hardcore mode was pretty rough. You had to get through the game with only saving it three times. If you died, you started back at your last save point, so you had to know the game well enough to save in the right spot and basically not die. It, it didn't take too long to beat 
part two on hardcore mode. It was just frustrating, uh, especially when you get too near the end and uh, a little bug jumps on you and you have to shake it off before you could uh, heal or attack at the oncoming monster and the monster just kills you before you have a chance to shake off the... But uh, other than that, part two is a great game too. Part three I haven't played. I would like to play part three, but I heard it's more action and multiplayer oriented, which I am very not fond of. Um, skipping action for horror is not cool. So, um, yeah, that's Dead Space. That was my top for PlayStation. Okay, so that was our uh, most feel good games. That brings back the best and fondest memories. But to, to even say that, it's not even really the truth because you just think back to all the other games that we've played. Final Fantasy 2 or 4, Final Fantasy 3 or 6. Uh, you've got Lufia 2. You've got all the Mega Mans. You've got Street Fighter. Just all the games that have a lot of good memories. So, uh, where do we want to go for next week? So, what I think is um, we need to let these people know where we come from, what our roots are, uh, you know, how we became to be the men that we are. The men. The men of hardness. <laughs> uh, you know, there, there's, um, you know, great depth to these minds, and we, we're going to let you explore them a little bit. We'll talk about our childhood, uh, our family. We have some great stories that you guys would enjoy. Uh, we're going to be making a, a Facebook and possibly Twitter page. Uh, I currently do not have Facebook. Um, my wife does. I just don't deal with it. I used to have MySpace, got bored with it. Not really into the social media thing. Uh, like, you know, I am uh, kind of, like Brandon said, we're shutter bugs. We like to be left alone. Um, but we are going to get out there. Uh, I feel we could really entertain a, a whole lot of you, so uh, look forward to that. So we want to probably next episode talk about probably our earliest memories that we have uh, childhood. Uh, I'd say we break we break up. Uh, there's different eras of our life. Um, for the first half, we could probably say the eras are pretty much similar. Up until we turn 18, that's when we start branching out. He's got his own uh, eras to go by, and I've got mine. Of course, there's those that we, you know, we interact and they intertwine sometimes. But uh, we'll try to get through, hopefully, first five years of life, uh, get through that up to where we we were born in South Sacramento. We lived there for until we were five or six, and then we just moved here. And we'll go into why we moved and how we moved and all that, but I'd say hope, next episode you hope to hear about our childhood up until we move up to North Sacramento, and hopefully we get uh, our first special guest next week, or maybe the week after, uh, get Matt, our little brother, since he'll be in town next week to come in and record and see how, uh, see his point of view growing up with him being the younger brother of two twins that would always torment him and well not pretty much not torment he deserved yes, it yes we tormented him <laughs> and he did deserve it and he with his oh, he would just say things to our mom like they threw me on the ground and crushed my ribs when all we did was you know just give him a little push or something he was he was dramatic like we all tend to be but hopefully we could do that get through the first five six years of uh, being in growing up in South Sac around the other Bartholomews the Bart and uh, get Matt on board, see uh, his his opinion, and go from there. So this will conclude week two or episode two of hunting for treasure hunting for nostalgia. All right, we'll see you later. Bye.